uh, this is my studio. I'm going to show you in it. It's my um, it's my heaven on earth. It's my nirvana. It's everything I've ever wanted. And I've waited 26 years in this property to finally get in here. Um, been working off site. And now I can stay in here. And uh, I've been in here about six months. So uh, come and have a look and get yourself a cup of tea and give it a go. So here we've got some old taxidermy and some new taxidermy. The idea I want to do is um, probably 50 old fur coats I have from the X antique shop and make them into animals. So rather than waste them and nobody wants to wear fur coats anymore, I will want to turn them into a bearskin rug or a dog or something, something from the fur. A lot of the old taxidermy gets really faded and the interest here was the growling fox. He's from He's actually Valentine's Day, a long time ago. To that end, I am going to make about six mongrel terriers. I don't know why I like mongrel terriers, but uh, you know, good old mongrel terrier, you can't go wrong because they can't be wrong because they can be anything you want them to be. What I want to do is get a collection of, which I have of old shields here. I'm not interested in doing a dog's body, but I am interested in doing dog's heads. I'll be painting that up. I'll be getting some nice pink in there and ivory on the fangs. And that's a great dog's skull. I'll uh, be constructing them with just a ball of chicken wire. And then I'll be getting my fur coats. I've got beautiful fox fur coats, such a waste otherwise. Glass eyes, got the whiskers all sorted, got the mold. You probably want to shock people and have them say, oh, you haven't stuffed the dog's head, have you? And of course, no, I haven't, but I'll, uh, I'll get six dogs out of the way and then, then I'll feel like I've done the dogs. We have, of course, I think a lot of people collect skulls. This is um, some bird skulls. We have this uh, monkey here, which I love. It's come off an old Japanese toy from the 1950s. I made this with um, latex and um, I'll show you up here. We've got the actual, the actual monkey. He's beautiful. He was actually a rattle. He made noise. And he's now a monkey riding a blowfish. He twirls. He's great. A little canopy, which is an old meat cover with a bit of raffia decoration. He's also got a mummified possum arm, which um, gives him this great sense of where he's going. And I love him because he moves. He's, he's fun. Him in white, we've got various things here that I'm going to make moles of because taxidermy really isn't politically correct anymore. So we've got a little turtle here. I've made a latex mold of the little turtle and he's gorgeous. His shell's beautiful. Now his, his mold is um, over here. The moles come up both in white and I've also been making them into just brown concrete. The beauty is you just get the brown concrete Put a bit of brown oxide powder into the white concrete. So this is the mold of the, and there's no thought in it, there's no painting. You just rub a bit of black into the brown and you've got the detail on the shell, the legs. Of course the turtle's sort of fun, he's a fun size. He could be walking around with a, with a skull, he could be walking around with anything. That's a great way. We obviously have some birds here. Birds were a common Victorian way of doing your taxidermy. Personally, I prefer all taxidermy in some dome or some box because of the dust. I don't like to think of it all getting in the feathers and that. Okay, so we've got Alice. Alice meets big ears. She was way too pretty. We couldn't have that. We had to make her a bit strange. She's got some I think these are African antelope arms. This body is made of an old um, mohair and hemp based 1930s poodle pajama case, which I don't know if any of you remember. My horse is forelock. And of course, we do have the bunny. The bunny, the head is positioned however you want it. It can have that sort of quizzical look, you know, off to the side, up, up, down. I've even had it nodding on a, on a way. I like having animals look like humans and humans looking like animals. And I don't know why that is, but I like to blur. I like to blur animals and, and people together. I love the odd skull. It's 
especially when you found it on the farm. And I like the fact that you can use all these found objects, you know, you've got the human foot and you've got the, you've got the old shoe lasts. I'll be making things out of most of this. This cockatoo here really wasn't in good condition apart from the head, so it went on a doll. The duck is um, a very old and a very collectible now. This is a very old cork-based duck decoy body. It had the neck coming up. Someone had snapped the beak off many, many years ago, and I found a completely mummified duck's head in the shed. I coated it in resin so it's all set and uh, it can look quizzical, whimsical, got the glass eyes but I love that you can see all the way through it too and it's great to scare children. The goat keeps falling over, it's a bit naughty so I found these two little booties. I've just made a mould and I'm going to cast them in black concrete and I'm going to it's set up so um, it won't fall over anymore. Harry Otter. This has been a, a hit with the family because um, it does scare children. I didn't think uh, otters were that scary, but yeah, they're scary. And I, I, I try to get the kids to stick their fingers in the mouth and some won't. But I think the scary otter is, uh, is hilarious. Probably one of the favorites of my friends is the, uh, is the kangaroo, kanga dog. He's on the dog base. He's got the old dog collar. And um, basically, he just lives straight off. I haven't uh, cemented him in because I quite like him looking at the otter or having a look around and changing his position. He's very old. He's what I would call play-worn. Most people are just so adamant he's a dog and not a kangaroo, but I can guarantee he's a kangaroo. The, uh, the baby zebra isn't a baby zebra. It's made of fur and is meant to look like a zebra, but uh, absolutely not. This is a, um, a splayed out, very decorative Victorian mutton bird. I just love the way the feathers, and I do love the monochromatic look, the black and the white and the brown and nature. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite skulls. This is a little, I think a vervet monkey skull, certainly a small monkey skull. It's very fragile. And I just love the teeth and the huge orbs and um, I mean, I'm very sad for the monkey, but uh, hopefully it died of natural causes. But that one's in a, in a dome just to protect it. Got a little squirrel here in a doll's body. Okay, quite a rare automaton, this one. He's a black boy um, street trader from Turkey. And uh, they used to go, the Turks would go to Africa, get a few slave boys in the 20s and make them work on the streets selling coffee. And these up, upturned palms are missing, and nobody knows where it ever was, but it uh, was an oval brass tray with a little coffee pot and the little Damacus coffee mugs. He starts by just, off he goes, goes all day, because he's got a big pendulum in here like a clock. So he can go all day. He's got the little fez, beautiful glass eyes. And he would be in a shop door displaying the coffee that they were trying to sell any coffee because Turkish coffee was a hit in the 20s it was a, a very strong coffee and it was a new thing everyone was probably drinking tea and it was uh, it was the way to go and the only thing you need to do to stop him is to do that but the kids get quite freaked out by it which is great we've got a friend sir uh, freaky fairy pig here. He's gorgeous with his tusks. His little eyes uh, go to sleep. And of course, as a freaky fairy goes, he, he floats through the air with the greatest of ease. This is something I've made for um, my only grandchild. So it's, uh, it's an old rocking horse it's, um, made of wood and filled with straw. And I rug hooked him um, to resemble a zebra just because I thought, well, no kid has a rocking zebra, so uh, it's a bit of a novelty. Very strong, he's quite heavy. An adult could ride him, basically. A short adult. There we go. We've got a couple of lacy iguanas, which were really common in Australia. This is the female, I think, with a little head, and we've got the male hanging somewhere. And I'm gonna mount 
mounted on the ceiling so they can chase each other. I've just taken a mold of him, a latex mold, and I'm going to be making copies of him because I just love the idea of uh, the texture of the scales. It's beautiful. Fingertips. I think a lot of people do always collect things when they're at the beach or they, they pick up a rock or we, we all have a thing of, I think, uh, you know, treasure, whatever you define as treasure. But um, this is just, just a few things along the way that I have picked up in different countries and uh, it's just nice. I always like to put things behind glass if you can. My other love, other than trying to develop in the, the faux taxidermy, is rug hawking. And uh, it's a really primitive form of rug hooking. There's about three ways of doing it, but I just do it with um, a crochet hook and you pull it through a piece of hessian. The exciting thing is I can make my own material, my own textiles out of, um, out of blankets. I just cut them into strips. I dye the old blankets. They're about $3 in op shops. And you can saturate it in color or you can splatter the color you can throw different colors on and it's just an exciting way i think of um having complete control you see the blanket there with its stripes on it it's an unlimited amount you could get a really strong blue and pull it out slowly out of the bucket of dye and get about 20 shades of blue i also use wool but that was like 14 dollars. that'll just be for accenting the top tips of some flowers so I do, I do use a bit of wool blends, some even some acrylic or some bits of mohair people have given me. I've got lots of wool. All this in here is full of wool. Nice to have lots of material before you even start. The rug hooking I want to do, I want to do them all as big circles and big stylized flowers. I always start by limiting the, the color palette. So on this one, you've got the orange and the greens and the purples. And that, believe it or not, is a stylized dandelion. And it gave me a big surprise. I had no intention of sticking eyes in the middle and all of a sudden it looked like War of the Worlds, really. I have hand painted these images of Victorian fairies riding insects, as you do. Reverse decoupage by gluing them on the inside of the vase, or in this case, the cloche. And then I gild behind them. I use mica powders and uh, use some gold size and gilding powder. It gives a very ethereal look, you know, it's just sort of nice and floaty. It's not definite, a lot of fun. It's really making your own worlds. When I first uh, started doing art, I was into a lot of realism, but I was really limited color wise. I really hated color. I, d I just liked the gray tones. I liked a black and white telly. I wouldn't have a color telly when they came out. Um, so I had a real gray face charcoal sketching. So this is uh, one of my cowboys when I went to America. I lived there a couple of years and I lived in Idaho up in um, the mountains and just love the lifestyle. And uh, always like rural scenes. This was my very first dog. He was a German Shepherd. Just a nice memory now. Had a couple of German Shepherds and certainly just got mongrel terriers now. Okay, this is um, this is my whimsy corner. I'm very whimsical. I just love um, childishness and and some things. Um, this is um, 1860 French frogs in love, beautifully done and very romantic. This is quite a rare dome because it's uh, it's squash. Most of the domes are round. This is a very old lead toad, and uh, he's probably being toad. Toad Hall or something, and I think he looks like he's had some sort of knapsack on him. I've made moles many years ago, and uh, quite crudely, really, is this one over here, and that that is a is a mold from this what I would call a bullfrog. But hasn't he got a beautiful back and bottom and thighs? And he's a beautiful toad. Right now, this is the piece de resistance. This is my mannequins. This is these are my men, the only men in my life. I'm very fond of both of them. This one hasn't been done yet, but I've got great plans for him. He is going to be the budgie smuggler. And he's got the budgie smuggler pants. I've got this beautiful embroidered budgie tablecloth, which I'm going to donate to him. He's going to be an imperial, very, very royal budgie smuggler. 
really doesn't go together, but it will for me. And this is my beautiful man. He is, he's absolutely stunning. I mean, really every bit about him, you just want to feel him. Everything's fur, hair. This is my horse's tail, my beloved horse's tail and her forelock. He's got cat ears. He's got this lovely, lovely brooch on him. And I didn't want to cover too much of him up. I just wanted to um, give him some nice little accentuated bits, like he's got a tail and it's real fur and his little cuffs are real fur. This is very special because this was my very first taxidermy job. My friends on a farm said, we've got a, we've got some testicles for you. We've got, we've got the testicles, the pizzle, which is from the sheep and the belly flap. And I wondered why they wanted to give it to me to, to practice taxidermy. And they said, it's hairy, it's not woolly. And they're breeding hairy testicles on their sheep so you can see what you're getting when you buy a ram, which makes sense really. And of course he's got some sort of animal, I don't even know what this is, it's some animal and um, he's got him, he's got him by a leash, he's got this lovely clip, uh, scares my grandson crazy because I've chased him with it, it's one thing, he's out of everything in this whole studio, he's very scared. But, um, He's like my perfect man. I can't think of anything better than him and you might as well create one and just keep him in the studio. I'd really like in the next five years just to be exactly where I am now, finally doing what I've always wanted to do, not commissions, not other people art, not art that you know will sell or that uh, has a market, but just to do whatever I want to do, whatever I feel like and wherever it takes me. I do believe if I won five million dollars, I wouldn't want to do anything different. And I know I don't want to live anywhere different and I love my life and this is taking me a long time to get to the place I want to be, which is in a studio doing my own art. Half rug hawking. I want to do about 15 different stylized flowers. I've got them all in my head and I've got some sketches done. You can go wherever you want. I, I hate counting or grids or anything that involves too much concentration. I like to go with it and let, let it happen. So you just use hessian and I'm making my own material and textiles are all about manipulating the material and just cutting the strips just how you want them in the right thickness and uh, the saturation of color that you want. So I'm a bit of a contradiction like split personality because I want to do this old school um, rug hooking and I want to do some pretty weird fake taxidermy, faux taxidermy and I want to do it to a very high level. I had an antique shop for 12 years. I collected a lot of leather, the fur coats, the beautiful embroidered uh, tablecloths, doilies, beautiful hand, hand work that the women spend ages doing. I don't think anyone really wants to use it now and I just really, really want to do it justice. Those ladies spent many, many hours, did beautiful work and it's all craft work, but I'd, I'd like to turn that into art. So everything in the studio is for sale, uh, bar my men, which um, I'll be keeping. And uh, and if you're interested or anything's caught your eye as we've gone round, I have a for sale section on my website and I'll put the link below. If anyone wants to come and uh, view the studio, maybe purchase um, one of my creations, um, they can just make an appointment, they can email me, they can look at my Facebook page, my website. I would welcome anyone to come and view it that way. In the past, I've had a lot of bus tours come here. They like the sculptures in the garden. They like the general environment, which is really beautiful. I love feedback. I love seeing people's reactions to some of the things I make. You know, they it really feeds your inspiration. I hope you've enjoyed the studio tour as much as I just love being up here. And feel free to subscribe to my channel as uh, part two of the studio tour is the stairway to heaven. See ya.